even when I stepped off the train in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, within my first breath, I had this strange feeling like I was going to live here. Like I just knew this was home. Bold Moves How Did You Know podcast, a podcast for the naturally curious who want to define their own path. Here, I'm sharing bold move stories that propelled my guests from curiosity to action. And in doing so, they've just defined a path that is purposeful to them. Through these stories, I hope you'll be inspired to pursue your boldest dreams. Today, I'm joined by Louis Heron. He's the founder of the Desert Hiking Company. He leads hiking expeditions in the Grand Canyon, and he started his company after many, many years of guiding hikes in national parks from Yosemite to Glacier National Park, and I know he'll tell us all about that. He also lives off grid, um, so he is a man of uh, many interesting things, and I'm really excited to welcome him to the show. Hi, Louie. How are you? Hi, Chris. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so glad you're here. We met actually in the most random of ways, maybe for me, but possibly not for you. Um, <laughs> we met in April when I was hiking the Grand Canyon. Um, my husband and I, we love hiking, but we are definitely not pros. So we decided that we wanted a guy help us um, hike the Grand Canyon because it can be a little torturous, we heard. So that's how we met you, Louie, um, about a month ago. And, you know, kind of while we were on our hike, the hours together, we got to learn a little bit more about you and your story. And I just knew that I had to invite you onto my podcast to talk all about it. So thanks for being here. Um, let, to kick us off, um, I know you're familiar with the theme of this podcast, which is all about bold moves. And you've made bold moves in your life, which we had a chance to, you know, kind of get to know a little bit while we were hiking with you. But would love for you to um, talk a little bit more about some of your bold moves in your life. And, uh, and, and, and also tell us a little bit more about you in general. I think that'd be a great place to start. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, uh, yeah, I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, and um, I'd say the uh, first bold move I ever made was leaving home. Um, I was uh, several years through a web development uh, degree in college. I went to Ball State University um, and uh, something just, you know, didn't really feel right going down that path. Um, I, you know, was not super inspired or motivated towards any particular direction and uh, sort of just felt like I needed a change of scenery, change of environment, um, as if, you know, that might be able to help me. And so I ended up uh, leaving school um, and kind of took a train ride out to the, the West Coast. My father works for um, or worked for Amtrak. He's now retired, but uh, why he was working there and why I was on his insurance plan, I was able to get free train travel anywhere in the country, which Ooh. I thought I had to take advantage of that. So um, I set sail on the Amtrak, uh, I want to say in 2011, and uh, came out west. And I contacted some distant relatives in the family who had settled on the west coast everywhere from Washington all the way down to San Diego. And um, immediately I knew uh, I had made the right choice. Uh, the West Coast was just so captivating to me. Um, the mountains, uh, just the desert, the scenery. And, um, and so uh, even though it was a very scary point in my life to make that decision to leave home and to kind of take this solo, soul searching journey, um, I was immediately, uh, you know, uh, reassured that I had made the right decision with just the experiences that I had, the, the relatives that I was able to meet, um, the uh, national parks I got to visit. And uh, I knew for certain that I had made the right choice and that I was no longer interested in a web design degree. So um, the rest mm -hmm. is sort of history. From there, I ended up um, getting a job in Yosemite National Park. And mm -hmm. uh, I'd say that was probably uh, where my life you know, had changed um, for the better. And I realized 
I, all of a sudden I became passionate about national parks, um, you know, and just started hiking every day, um, wanting to learn everything about the flora and fauna and the geology, started going to all the ranger mm. talks, every museum, um, and really just educating myself as much as I can on, um, you know, my surroundings and my environment. And so from that time in Yosemite, I got hooked in into the national park system and knew that I wanted to work and live in the national parks um, in some capacity uh, moving forward in the future. And I landed in um, Flagstaff, Arizona, I want to say late 2012. And this town sort of greeted me with open arms, um, with some job opportunities. And this is where I became a wilderness first responder um, through the National Outdoor Leadership School, which kind of trains you in um, backcountry skills and tactics of treating and assessing patients. And um, that training and, and medical certification enables you to become a professional guide inside the National Park System. And so um, I've been guiding ever since. And it was about three years ago uh, after working a while for employers in the area that I decided to start my own company. And um, yeah, and then that's what brings me here. That's how we met about a month ago. I want to rewind really quickly back to when you were doing web design and sure. you're, you know, I don't know. I imagine, you know, just in your traditional classroom setting and you're not vibing with it. What was it, Louie, that made you feel like off that something about the career path that you were going down wasn't right? That's a great question. Uh, I think it was just, you know, a lack of, um, of vision. Uh, it was a lack of inspiration. Didn't necessarily feel super motivated um, in that career path. Um, I, you know, realize I'm a pretty sensitive creature. I think felt <laughs> confined inside, a, you know, 10 by 10 dorm room with white walls mm -hmm. and fl fluorescent lights. Um, I, you know, just, it's, it wasn't really the environment uh, that was engaging enough for me to feel like I was actually learning and making progress and developing, um, you know, spiritually the way that I, that I wanted to. Um, so, it, you know, I just knew that I, I didn't really um, feel uh, capable of growing in that situation. And, uh, you know, it's kind of easier to know what you, what you don't want in life to, than to know what it is that you actually want. And I, and in that moment, I definitely knew that, okay, I don't really want to continue this path. Um, and uh, my gut instinct was, you know, why don't you travel? Why don't you, you know, see the West Coast, see, you know, a change of scenery and get a new environment and, and see what comes from there. I mean, at that point, I would was expecting to return home um, with some inspiration, but instead I got stuck. <laughs> so when you got to Yosemite, um, and, and this is kind of where your love of, of hiking and adventure seemed to have started. How did, you know, it make you feel being there? How did you know that this was something that you wanted to pursue as your next, you know, a next step in your career versus just visiting Yosemite for a day or a week exploring? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, well, I, I gone to Yosemite first for a job opportunity. So uh, basically when my bank account ran dry and I realized, okay, I'm going to have to go back home. Uh, mm. I was like the option, the only other option I had was to start applying for jobs and see if I could make it work out here in the West. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, sent about 30 applications out um, various national parks and um, ended up getting a job in uh, both Yosemite and Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska. And so it's kind of funny mm -hmm. to simultaneously get these job offers in these pretty incredible locations. Um, but uh, I could only afford the travel fare to Yosemite. So that made my decision for me because I was like, well, I can't afford a plane ticket to Alaska, but I can afford to hop on the train and go to Yosemite. So um, I was brought to Yosemite for the job opportunity and it was really just, you know, washing dishes. It was actually one of the worst jobs that I'd ever had. 
but all of a sudden I was surrounded by waterfalls and mountains and um, just this incredible scenery that I could only dream of. Um, and yeah, it's just something was in the air. I just felt at home right away. I love that. I've had that sense before, Louis, where um, the place spoke to my soul. That's kind of what it seems to me you're saying is like you just felt while you were there, like the soul connection to the environment. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah, I, it's hard to it's hard to explain it. But, you know, even when I stepped off the train in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, within my first breath, I had this strange feeling like I was going to live here. Like I just knew this was home. Yeah, I love that. And actually, I haven't spoken about that before, but same thing happened to me, ironically, in a completely different way in New York City. So completely opposite from the uh, <laughs> the peace of the zen of the nature. But I had that experience in New York City, just the energy and the, the thrill of it to me in that city environment. I just was taken by New York and, and I eventually lived there as well because of that you know want that desire that i guess my heart was like wanting to be there uh, pretty badly so made it happen but but i think too as we talk about you know and, and on this podcast you know a lot of, um the theme is around helping people to find their own path and i think that's a, such an important point is like you know when you're in this place that really calls you because it feels so connected to who you are absolutely yeah um even just, you know, not not only just the way that you you feel in a certain environment, but also the way you're received, right? It's um when when the people um, that come with the environment, the community, uh, you know, receives you with open arms and just makes you feel um, like you're seen and heard and and understood and accepted. Um, that was a big difference, you know, leaving the Midwest culture and the demographic there and coming into the national park system, I just felt like, oh, these are these are my people. Um, I definitely mm. feel more at home there. And I'll never forget, I had somebody tell me, I was like, oh, I love this place. And he's like, this place loves you. <laughs> and uh, to wow. me, that just yeah. like, you know, just to think about it in that sense, um, uh, I was like, hey, I think he's right. Like, uh, sometimes you just don't know what you truly want until it's right in front of you. Right. So had anybody else in your family or even friends that you that, you know, uh, lived, you know, this lifestyle that you wanted that you now found yourself in or, or were, was this, you know, something that you discovered on your own with really no influence from anybody else? I definitely was the black sheep of my family. Um, this was all all on me I would say <laughs> and I'm sure it, and, it drove my mom and dad crazy <laughs> for a while they thought I was probably giving up or throwing my life away and probably couldn't understand until um, they actually came out to visit and they saw sort of the the life I forged for myself but but yeah there's really I was the first family member to to leave home and to settle west so you eventually started guiding hikes right with groups of people um, and in, in many different national parks, I think. So, um, how did you start to think that, well, this could actually be what, what I do for work, my, my full-time job where I want to put my, my career, my personal and professional passions. How did you start to realize that? Well, yeah, another great question. Uh, I would never in a million years have guessed that you could make a living as a guide. Um, you know, when my very first uh, trip into the canyon, a place called Havasupai, a guided trip, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was just one of the most incredible experiences I had ever had. And to to be a guide on that trip, to be in service to people, to make them feel comfortable, to feed them, um, to give them the confidence they need to push through some challenging moments. Um, that just came naturally to me. I just felt like this, this, this is just, um, I'm in my element. And then, you know, when I got out of the canyon and finished that trip and uh, my boss gave me a paycheck, I was just like, what's this? Like, I didn't even expect to get paid for it because I thought the experience oh, wow. was so incredible. 
Um, but then, you know, once I realized that there is, you know, money in guiding, um, it's obviously a service industry position. So there is tipping. Um, and I just, you know, saw uh, a lot of the guides in the community were, you know, in their 30s and 40s. Some of them were married with 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 kids. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, hey, like these people are, are, are great human beings. I mean, they're very compassionate, they're empathetic, they're, they're in service to other people. They, you know, they're here to help others, but they prioritize, um, you know, a, a life outside, um, taking care of the environment, you know, outdoor education. And so I just looked up to all the people in the community. I look up to guides. Um, I think they're some of the highest caliber uh, people on the planet. And so I just wanted to follow down that path. And again, it's kind of like who you, who you surround yourself with, um, you know, you kind of yeah. eventually become so. Yeah, that's also a good lesson, right? Is surround yourself with the people that you want to be, you know, that you want to emulate, right? Um, Cause they can share and, and provide so many different lessons to help you get to where you want to be. That certainly sounds like it was true for you. Um, you eventually, after, you know, going, leading and guiding hikes and tours through all of these national parks, you've decided and settled on, it sounds like, the Grand Canyon. So what what is it about the Grand Canyon that's so spectacular that really captured you to want to make a life there? Yeah, um, well, you know, the desert has been the most captivating um, landscape that I've ever experienced. Um, I had no idea that I was going to fall in love with Arizona and the Grand Canyon. Um, after, you know, guiding in Yosemite, uh, Yellowstone, after working um, in Glacier Park, um, as much as I love the, the mountains and I love the access to, to the lakes and rivers and streams, um, you know, I sort of realized that I liked, I liked dry camping. I liked uh, not having any grizzly bears to have to deal with, uh, not dealing with mosquitoes. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the lack of, of humidity and moisture um, was just a, an amazing feeling to me. Um, you can really travel lightweight in the desert. A lot of times you don't need to even pack a tent. Um, you can kind of just lay out under the stars, which just felt um, really special and unique. So I always tell people really what separates working in the canyon as opposed to other parks is no bears, no bugs, and it barely rains. And so that was what yeah. sold me, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I've been to, I had been to Arizona maybe one time before I was there recently. And, but, but never, I think it was for a work trip and I was in and out. And this last time, um, Greg and I were there for a week and we kind of did a whole, you know, made several different stops. So we started in Phoenix and Scottsdale. We went to um, Flagstaff and then to the Grand Canyon. And then after that, we went to Sedona for the day and then back to Phoenix. So we had this kind of cool tour over like within three hour driving distance. And I was so um, taken by the different views, the different scenery, the different micro environments even in all of these different places that are literally within like what two to three hours of each other and um i just i loved it so much and was also captivated by it um making me want to continue exploring that area of the country because it is so beautiful um i think i took uh, your advice actually louis when we were on our way out i don't know if you remember this but you know, we asked you, we're headed back to Scottsdale from the Grand Canyon, and should we stop through Sedona, and what should we, you know, or, or is anywhere else that we should go? And you you um, advised us expertly that we should do this <laughs> drive between Flagstaff and Sedona called Oak Creek Canyon, right? And right. I have got to tell you, Louie, I've never seen anything more beautiful. I was like, so like everywhere you're looking is like another scene. Like, how is this reality? <laughs> how does this exist? You know, in the United States, it was so cool. 
Um, so I totally understand and like can see your, your perspective on, you know, how cool of a place it is to plant roots. I had to ask you what off grid meant. I, I had heard the term. I didn't really know what it all meant. So for, for listeners who might not know what off grid living is all about, can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So off grid would literally mean just like off the power grid, I would say. Um, so there's no, no power lines in my area. So no way to access um, the grid of power. Um, also, mm -hmm. there's no, you know, water supply. So there's no public water um, supply to access. So without drilling a well, you have to um, bring your water in. Uh, so uh, I haul water. Um, there's a community well about five miles away from where I live and I have to bring a truck uh, with a empty, you know, water tank in the back. I can haul about 200 gallons at a time. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a, a water account with the, uh, with the dispenser there and um, kind of just punch in my, my numbers and then tell the, the computer how much, how many gallons that I need. And then it'll dispense water into the back of my truck. And then I bring mm. that back and I will pump that into some in-ground cisterns. And then I use solar panels to charge mm -hmm. up some batteries. And then uh, that powers my water pumps that I can use um, to pump water into my house for showering, laundry, sinks, uh, toilet, um, et cetera. So very unconventional. Um, you know, when you haul your own water, you definitely develop a different relationship with water and become a lot more conservative and um, respectful yeah. towards its use. Uh, I've ended up um, setting up rain catchment systems so that all of my all of my roofs uh, will catch rain or snow melt, and then that will drain into those cisterns. So that kind of helps um, get me some extra water uh, without having to pay for it or, or haul it. Um, so, so you, d you definitely want to catch as much rain as you can. Um, if not, you're going to end up hauling it. You can get water delivered out there. There's obviously water delivery services. Um, but I've, I've really enjoyed hauling my own water. It, it becomes sort of a meditative experience for me. And um, it's just, I enjoy doing it and spending all day. And I, I like forming that bond with, with water and, and how precious of a resource it actually is. Um, so between solar for power and uh, hauling water or bringing water mm -hmm. in um, to use, um, that, that, that's mm -hmm. really sort of, you know, what off-grid truly means. Um, I uh, often use wood. Um, I, you know, had a wood burning stove for a while. I actually just converted to propane. Um, so propane is a great fuel source for cooking with or um, heating a household with. Um, so those are sort of, yeah, that, that's the unconventional lifestyle of, of an off-grid home, I would say. So how did you decide that you wanted to live off-grid? Like you said, using your own words, this unconventional lifestyle, you know, that's a bold move. Um, <laughs> it comes with its own set of obstacles and challenges that now I'm sure are habitual and second nature to you now, but in the beginning, you know, I have to imagine that you encountered many different challenges to overcome, uh, just getting used to the lifestyle. Why did you decide that this was an important way of life for you? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, you know, I often wonder if it was just, uh, you know, naive optimism, uh, those six years ago when I thought, oh, I'll move off grid and, uh, you know, learn how to build and live sustainably, because um, it's definitely not easy. Um, but, you know, I, I had bought the land and didn't know exactly what I was going to do with it, but I knew it was going to be valuable someday. And living in Flagstaff, um, the, the cost of living just was going up annually. The town has been going through some gentrification and rent had been, you know, doubling in, in cost. Um, and, uh, it really just seemed like, you know, an, a great outlet, a great opportunity, especially since, um, all my income was, was based at the Grand Canyon. Um, since that was my career as a, as a guide, um, my property was about halfway between Flagstaff and the Canyon. So, um, it was going to cut the commute to work in half and it would have saved me, 
you know, a lot um, in terms of, you know, not having to, to afford um, the exorbitant rent in, in Flagstaff at the time. So, um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a leap of faith. Um, I think I've always been drawn to, um, you know, ownership of, of land. Um, I'm a pretty stubborn person. I like to do everything myself. Um, and I like to learn how things are, are done so that, you know, I can fix things. Um, it, it just felt like it was, you know, the challenge I wanted to accept and that I wanted to be closer to the wilderness, closer to the canyon. Um, you know, just every time I had gone and visited the, the property, I felt a special connection to it. It really felt like, you know, it was just peaceful. It was quiet. I had this, you know, beautiful sky full of stars at nighttime and, um, and, and learning the trade of, of, of building and, and what goes into a home, it, it just gave me so much uh, more of an appreciation of, um, you know, homesteading and, and, and the conveniences that we take for granted today. Um, so yeah, I, I think ultimately I realized it's like, I, I'd rather put up with, you know, the consequences of living off grid in that environment than the consequences of of living in downtown Flagstaff at that time. So um, that's the path that I chose. It's really interesting. And, you know, I, I love, I love it, you know, for, for somebody who lives a traditional lifestyle, right. With all the modern day amenities and all of that. Um, it's very inspirational to, to, to remind us to think about the environment, about conserving, uh, and, you know, even about the resources that we use and take for granted every day, right? That there are things even in the modern world that we can do to conserve energy, to conserve water, and all of that. And it, it's, a, it's a good reminder that we should think about what we're doing and not just take everything for granted. So I appreciate your sharing, you know, kind of what you how you live on a day to day basis to remind us all that it's really important the environmental footprint that we all create. Have there been any moments of doubt or challenge um, that you've encountered or faced along your journey? And and speaking of you know another progression in your whole bold moves journey has been starting your own company, um, the Desert Hiking Company, right? Where you're leading, you're you're the owner and CEO of this company, and you're you know, providing the service of, of guiding hikes and tours in the Grand Canyon. Ha, have there been moments of doubt around, along your, your journey that um, you've been able to learn from along the way? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I would say reoccurring moments of doubt. Um, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> there's, uh, it, it, it's definitely not easy um it's not an easy path at all and you know i wouldn't recommend it i don't think it is for everybody um for me though it's uh you know i reached a point um in my career where uh you know i i, I wasn't feeling valued for you know the effort that i gave to the job um and you know there was just less reciprocity i felt like uh when working for um another entity and, um, you know, I, I would voice certain concerns or, you know, maybe complaints for the way that things were being done and felt like my voice would have was drowned out. Um, a company that I used to work for was sort of, you know, growing to the point of being, you know, almost like a corporate mentality. And, you know, instead of being on a first name basis, it felt like I was just a number now. And, um, you know, I really hit this wall in my career. Like, it's just not worth it. The the effort that I give into uh, providing these experiences for people, you know, my heart's in it, but um, I, I I didn't feel like it was sustainable with the, the compensation that I was getting and um, sort of just, you know, feeling a little bit restrictive as to um, how I wanted to, to conduct myself and do business. So, without, you know, just throwing in the, the towel completely and, and finding a whole new career path, um, which I really weighed those options for quite some time. Um, you know, I decided the, the only way I can really, you know, save my career, my future as a guide and do this for the rest mm -hmm. of my life is if I did it for, for myself. And that just allowed me mm -hmm. to 
um, you know, attract the clientele that I wanted to attract and, and to, and to basically be the, the difference in the guiding industry that, that I, that I wanted to see and, um, you know, treat guides, um, you know, the, the, the best way possible that, you know, guides are the product, basically, they are the foundation of the yeah. guiding industry. And too many times I see companies just overwork and underpay their, their guides and uh, treat them, you know, almost as, as if they're disposable. And, um, and it just didn't seem sustainable. So, so, you know, my goal with the company was just to, um, to, you know, build a better community of, of guides and, um, you know, and, and, and try to set uh, sustainable values for the company. Um, and so, uh, you know, I had many doubts about starting a new company and competing with, you know, Flagstaff is, is very competitive when it comes to guiding. And there's, you know, so many guiding companies in the area, especially at the Grand Canyon. And I didn't really understand. I, I didn't really know how I was going to compete, you know, at that level. Um, but uh, thankfully, I sort of found a niche market and feel very privileged to have um, been in business through the pandemic and sort of made it these last three years. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I honestly don't know how I'll make it through another year. And um, just the way it's worked out, I continue to uh, succeed at that. And, um, I'm not really anxious to grow, you know, rapidly. I, I'm, I'm looking for just organic, sustainable growth. And I just really want to sustain the lifestyle that I currently live. And so, um, yeah, I don't know what's around the corner, but, um, if I've made it this far, then I have good hopes that, you know, I can keep this going and hopefully, uh, have, happy clients and happy guides and and make an impact on on the industry here yeah that's super cool and um recently or i think it was recently maybe it was last year i remember you're telling me that cnbc um came came knocking and wanted to do some filming with you so that's pretty cool uh result of your um your company and the business that you're building because i think you mentioned to me that they saw the five-star reviews that you had received and that was you know the point at which they said okay we got to talk to this guy so i think you know following your own vision and even though we all don't know what we're doing <laughs> following your own vision um has some really cool um outcomes that you may not expect yeah absolutely it, i've been realizing it's it's um you know there's a lot of fear built behind these decisions that you might make um, for yourself, for your career. And I think you have to ask yourself, you know, are you more afraid of confronting, you know, those decisions or are you more afraid of what your life looks like if you don't confront them? And I think, you know, sort of fast forwarding and thinking like, you know, if I don't try now, if I don't make these decisions for myself, if I don't at least try, um, you know, am I, will I regret this later? And so, um, I think a lot of times we might hesitate because we can't understand what our future might look like, but it's really just about taking that step, that leap of faith, just doing, you know, it, what your gut says, what your heart says, and then, you know, the understanding comes later. So um, that's yeah. definitely been a, a lesson for me. That's a great one. And um, my, my final question always is, um, what do you know about being bold today that you wish you had known earlier on? And I almost wonder if that was the response, but what, <laughs> is there anything else that comes to mind as you think about, you know, some of these bold moves you've made over your life and your career? Is there anything that you wish you would have known or, or taken action on because you, you know, you, what, of what you know now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, again, it's understanding that, you know, well, the mind can be fickle and, you know, it's important to, to go with, with your gut, go with your heart. There's a reason you're being called. Um, there's a reason that you're being inspired uh, towards a certain uh, goal. And, and listening to that um, is important. Sometimes it takes, you know, tempering the mind 
um, and 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 doing what you're most afraid of. I mean, where 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 you find fear, I think, is sort of an important place to look for, um, you know, personal growth and and development and and what you're being called towards. And 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 you know, going up against scary decisions and and scary life changes and moves, you know, you're the courage comes after you confront those things right you're not you're not gonna just magically find courage to confront them it's it's in confronting what you're afraid of that your it's courage you know comes afterwards and so that's sort of you know almost like a reverse psychology sort of thing so for me um i've been trying to use that you know i I do get anxious. I do get nervous. I suffer from anxiety. And rather than letting that stand in my way, you know, just imagining what my life would be like if I didn't take these chances, then you can almost use your anxiety to fuel you, you know, and to push you forward as instead of to to keep you held back. So um, if I've learned anything, I'd say it's, yeah, kind of how to use anxiety to your advantage and and to confront you know the things that you're most afraid of and and maybe you'll be surprised so i love that use anxiety to your advantage ooh that's a good one um <laughs> all right i really appreciate you being here lily it was so good to see you again too and um i want to ask if listeners want to learn more about you or go on a hike with you where where can they they go to learn more absolutely so you can check me out at uh, deserthikingcompany.com. Um, that's my company website. And uh, you can also find me on Airbnb. Um, I believe that's how we connected. So uh, if anybody is staying in Airbnbs near the Grand Canyon, uh, I host Airbnb Experiences and been very grateful to them to allow me to host on their platform. And that's offered me some great exposure. Um, otherwise, you can find me at deserthikingcompany.com or Desert Hiking Co. on Instagram, Twitter, and other social media platforms. All the socials. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Louie. I really appreciate it. And uh, for all the listeners, thanks for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss another episode. We'll see you next time. Bye.